All right. I think we're ready to go. All right, okay. We are going to be looking at the missionary methods of Paul. And, uh, and just so you know, I know it has been, uh, it's been a little bit confusing because we've been looking, Jeffrey's been looking at the missionary methods of Jesus on Wednesday nights. But it seems like every time we've had a Sunday night, we have had a, either it's the singing night, which that's then we're not focused on the class uh, we had that special night for our graduates. We've had some other uh, nights that has caused us not to have the class. And so this is the first of our missionary methods of Paul. And so uh, this is going to be the introduction of this. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, as we're, we're looking at the missionary methods of Paul, it's been surrounded by our focus for Mission Sunday. And, and this is kind of the, the mission month as we've, we've been discussing and really focusing this quarter on on our missionary efforts. But this is also really important to look at how they approached taking the Great Commission. And in fact, if we can look at what Jesus has done and we look at what Paul has done, it's going to help us in the way that we're reaching out. <clears throat> but I think it's important to mention, <clears throat> my voice is uh, getting, let's see. Uh, I think it's important to mention with our mission our mission Sunday, and in fact, that John just mentioned, 112,212 as of this morning that has already been given. That is so powerful. And, and uh, just for us to, to think about that in a practical way, on Wednesday night, <clears throat> excuse me, I was at Asheville Road. That might be good if I could. I, I tell you, I didn't think it was that bad. It's just all of a sudden I got a, did y'all see the frog jump in here? I, I don't know. <clears throat> Well, uh, I was, I think that, was, that got it, um, was at uh, Asheville Road on Wednesday night. I was speaking for their spring series. And so I got to see uh, one of our, our missionaries' families, right? And so I uh, got to see Drew Kaiser and Barton Kaiser that were supporting his twin brother. I almost said, Barton, I just talked about you. But they're identical. It was McKenzie, and he gets that all the time. But I mentioned to him at that time, it was Wednesday, I said, we have raised $100,000 for Mission Sunday. We've just added 12000 to that. And I said, that means Barton gets to stay in the mission field. And they both went, woo-hoo-hoo! And like, it was just the greatest thing. You know, so when we're, we're thinking about our missions, this is, this is affecting those mission fields in such a powerful way, and it is so encouraging. So I wanted to bring that up. I thought it was very fitting that, uh, that, we, that we focus on that. So since we're cu currently focusing on the missionary methods of Jesus on Wednesday night, and that we're beginning the missionary methods of Paul, I believe that they complement each other very well. Paul complemented Jesus in every way. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And this is complimenting my throat in every way. Who has 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 17? Oh, yes, Darnell. All right, Christian's on his way. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have, a, have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Isn't that powerful? We just talked about Paul's mother in the Lord. Here we see that Paul has been a father to the Corinthian congregation, but also to Timothy, and that's why he sent Timothy there. But notice he's, he talks specifically about imitating him. So when we talk about the missionary methods of Paul, imitating Paul is, is going to help us in outreach efforts, in our outreach efforts. And, and so how do, we Im how do we imitate Paul? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Jeffrey has that. Just a few chapters over. Be imitators of me, just as I also of Christ. Mm. So he's saying, be imitators of me as I am also of Christ. And so when we're imitating Paul, we're actually talking about imitating Christ. So we see how the two studies, the Wednesday night study and the study here tonight, links together very well. Because when we're imitating Paul, we are imitating Christ. But there are some practical applications that we can, we can glean from studying Paul 
to know how to maybe complement what Jesus did uh, just as much. And so it's, it's extremely important. So what is there in Paul that we need to imitate? Well, Paul was a chosen instrument, a chosen instrument. And I'm going to read Acts chapter 9 and verse 10 through 15. The first part of it, we'll finish that. That's why I've kind of chosen this to where I would read it. So I'll just stop at the spot that I want to. You can read ahead if you would like. But we're going to look at Acts 9 and 10. And, and again, this is after Paul has been on the road to Damascus. And we're reading about Ananias. In verse 10 it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias uh, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. You ever thought about this? He's, he could be, very well be thinking, you know, Lord, I've heard this man, Saul, is notorious. He's blind. Let's keep it that way. He won't find any of us. But here, notice he says, he said, verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine. We'll stop there just a moment. So Jesus is saying that Paul's a chosen instrument. And so when we're talking about being an imitator of Paul because Paul's an imitator of Christ. Christ himself says he's a chosen instrument. And so if he's a chosen instrument, then that's going to help equip us. Uh, and so we're talking about this instrument equipping us. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. Who, who has that? Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. Did I hand that out? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And he gave, gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature man, to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So, thank you, Jeffrey. What's going to stop us from being children tossed to and fro by the waves and the wind of doctrine? Doctrine of teachings that have come from human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. What stops us is, is the, the instruments that God has given us. He gave, verse 11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Right, so there is a doctrine that's been handed to us from God, but then there's also a doctrine that is, is distorted by man. And the only way we're going to tell the difference is by the instruments that we're using. Have you ever gone to, to do something that uh, maybe use a tool for what it was not intended? Try, try to, you know, maybe because you didn't have a hammer, you go and you try. I remember didn't have a hammer and I used a hairbrush. I don't know why it was there. I just smacked. Man, that poor hairbrush was destroyed. And that nail never even got driven into anything. I said, what have I done? How dumb was that? Uh, I remember my dad using an axe. And he was hitting, never do this, hitting at a limb like this. And he got it to where it was just barely holding on. And he turned it around and he used the handle to hit it. That did not go well. But very thankfully, it was just the handle. But I remember hearing, you know, Dad coming in, and, and, and it was, he was in a lot of pain. But, uh, and, and I remember hearing why and learning, I'm never going to do that. You, there's, some, there's some kinds of tools that you would use that you would never want to misuse. And so you think about the instrument that has been given by Paul. It's there to equip us for the work of ministry. And we've got the equipment that is necessary, and it's not up to us to sit there and say, well, you know, I think this hammer's going to work, but I, 
I've got to screw this screw in there. You know, we don't have to do that, and we should not do that. We have the equipment for the, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The opposite would tear it down. So the instrument that we have is Paul. All right, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All right. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All right, so, the, the, so not only do we have, we have teachers, we have evangelists, shepherds, and preachers for, that, that are given us by God for, for equipping the saints for the work of ministry, the way that we know they're given to us by God is through the words that God has given. All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it is through this that we're going to have the reproof, the correction, the training in righteousness. That list of instruments that we just read about, there's going to be reproof, there's going to be correction, there's going to be training in righteousness from those individuals to help us be ready for the work of ministry. Uh, and so we'll be competent, equipped for every good work. We talk about going into all the world. It's so important that we have the right tools to do that so that we're competent in it. And so that's where the training comes in. And so Paul really provides that training in a very good way. And, and so we're going to be looking for the next, for, for the remainder of our class at the last part of Acts 9, 15 through 16. Um, I see that this is the key verse for our missionary methods of Paul. All right, Christian is over there, Bob Keith. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. You ever just stopped and... You know, Ananias is one that he would, he would want to gladly uh, turn over and go back to sleep. Uh, he would gladly not want to go to the house of Simon the Tanner. But he would have stopped the instrument from even being used for the kingdom of God. If, if Ananias, based on what he saw, what he thought, had his way, then we would not have had this key passage for the missionary methods of Paul. And we're going to use this to really come back to it because we're going to see how he approached this throughout this, this study. And it's going to be more of an abbreviated one because we've had maybe a, a, a later time getting into it, but that will be fine. In the first place, what does it say? That he would carry the name of Jesus before the Gentiles. Carry the name of Jesus before the Gentiles. At this point in, in Acts chapter 9, it has only been to the Jews. At this, at this point, we, well, we realize it's the, the next step has been going down to Samaria. In Acts 8, they've been able to go, to go into Samaria. Peter and John have come in, and they've, put their, they, they've been able to lay their hands upon those who were baptized, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's when Simon the sorcerer said, Hey, give you some money, and, and maybe you can give me that gift of giving that Holy Spirit. And so he has come to Samaria, so the Samaritans have obeyed the gospel. That's the, that's the next step into bringing all people into the fold. But at this point, these are Jewish Christians who are being persecuted, who are being sent in this dispersion. And so Saul, who has caused the dispersion, is actually going to be the key ingredient, the key instrument in order to take the message to the Gentiles. Again, if you were to talk to, if you were to, talk to Paul right away and say, hey, by the way, I know you're... I know you're a zealot. Uh, I know that you're, you're, you're adamant of, of trying to take all of these people who are part of the way and bring them bound back to Jerusalem. You know, you have these papers in order to do this, but guess what, Paul? You're going to go to the Gentiles. <laughs> Can you imagine if it was just relayed to him like that? It was going to take blindness, for one, for Paul to realize, wait a minute, I thought. I thought I was doing what was right. I thought that I was being zealous for the way, the way that was handed down to me through my fathers, but not this new way. Now he realizes he's, just pers he's been persecuting Jesus. Uh, and so let's go to Romans 1, verses 1 through 7. Let's see what Paul has to say about 
this, this ministry that's been given to him uh, for the Gentiles. Romans 1, 1 through 7. Mike. Servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to whom to all whom are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. You know, notice he's he, he gives a great backstory to how the Gentiles came to be a part of the kingdom. Notice you have, he has promised this. He's, he has, you know, Christ has uh, called to be an apostle. So he was an apostle before any of the others. He was, he was called from God's right hand to be set apart for the gospel of God. And he promised it beforehand. How did he do so? Through the prophets. So Paul, in order for him to understand that he was going to be the minister to the Gentiles, he had proof, and he needed the proof in order to understand this. And so this is how he was able to, to, to know this, through the prophets of the Holy Scriptures, and it was concerning his son. And he was a descendant from David according to the flesh, right? So he's telling the Roman Christians here, he says that... Verse 5, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. All right, so he recognized that he was, uh, again, this, you know, appointed to, uh, to the Gentiles. And again, if you've got any thoughts on this, feel free to, to mention it. I know sometimes in, in the auditorium it's, it's hard to, uh, to have discussion, but I would love for that to take place. But let's look at Ephesians 3, 4 through 10. Who, who has this? All right, yeah, Ansel. When you read this, you can perceive that my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ansel. Uh, notice, Paul is he's saying that there was, this was a part of the plan of the mystery that was hidden for ages in God who created all things. What was it that was hidden for all ages but has now been made known, has been revealed, that the grace that would be given to the Gentiles that he would preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, that they would be able to have access to grace. And so, again, he's saying it's through this grace that I was appointed as a minister to the Gentiles. So Paul recognized that it was the very grace of God. Notice he says he was the least of all the saints. Why would he say he was the least? Because he persecuted the church. Based on Acts chapter 9, our key passage, he thought that he knew better. Uh, based, on, on, uh, based on his teachings at the feet of Gamaliel, he was so well versed in, in, in knowing that this way had to be wrong. But he didn't listen to the very words of Gamaliel who, who said, Hey, these men might be of God. You might find yourself actually fighting against God. And so, again, Paul didn't take the very advice of his own teacher. 
Uh, and so again, he's obviously remembering this because he says, I'm the least of all the saints. But it's the grace of God that he wasn't struck dead. It's the grace of God that he's able to be proclaiming this message to the Gentiles. All right, so keeping in mind this idea of the carrying the name of Jesus before the Gentiles, we're going to look at how he did this uh, in, in, future, in our future study. I'd like for us to break this down and look at, at how did he approach speaking to the Gentiles and how practically that can that apply to how we approach someone who has a different background. And, and so I think there would be a practical application for that. And I think that would be, it would merit for us to have a class dedicated to that. All right, so the next one was to carry the name of Jesus before kings. Before kings. Um, Acts 25, 22 all the way through the end of the chapter into 26, verse 1. Who, who has that? Yeah. All right. Brother Dyer. All right. Christian's on his way. Yeah. And then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. The next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the auto, 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 audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus says, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that we ought to live, he ought to live no longer. Mm. or any longer. I found he had n done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to, to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have, nothing def I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is un unreasonable to send a prisoner up on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. All right, then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. Right, so... Thank you very much, Brother Dyer. And, and I know that was a lengthy reading, but remember, this is an occasion where Paul has appealed to Caesar at this point. He's not getting a fair trial. And so because he's appealed to Caesar because he's a Roman citizen, that has caused the governor, uh, Festus, to be very afraid because, uh-oh, I have no reason that I've kept him for so long. I don't have a charge. And if I don't have a charge to send him to Caesar, who's in trouble? The governor. You've held a Roman citizen without charge. And so he's desperate to hear the charge. Well, Paul is desperate to get the gospel out. Talk about an opportunity. So this is the, this is the occasion where Paul is literally given free reign before a king, before a governor, Please give us something so that we can write down why you're going to Caesar. And that's going to come out when he's sitting there and he's relaying this message. Festus is looking for anything he can find. But Paul is looking for any opportunity to reach kings and governors. And I love this. I wish we had time to even go further into this. And, uh, and so he tells of his conversion account. And we, we know uh, of, that, uh, of that account. And he's telling about uh, on his way to Damascus, as we've read in Acts chapter 9. And so let's, who's got Acts 26, 24 and through 29? All right, uh, down here with Yvonne. Christian's on his way. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before, whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escaped his attention, since this thing was not done in common, in corner. 
King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might both become almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Mm, isn't that powerful? Uh, I would lo I'd love to have been a fly on the wall just to hear what was going on. But you notice what, what Festus is saying? Uh, he's saying, you're out of your mind, Paul. Much learning has driven you mad. What do you think he's looking for? A reason to give to the Caesar he's just appealed to. But Paul then uses that to respond, I'm not out of my mind. I'm not out of my mind. This is why. And you can almost see the look of Eureka. I found something that I can, I can send with him and I'm not going to get in trouble. That's, that's, that's the perspective I have on that. But you can almost see his face go from Eureka to, uh, <laughs> because he now, he uses this as an opportunity to, to try to reach the, uh, Agrippa, to try to reach the king. And Agrippa recognizes it. And it's, it's interesting because it could be in a question form or in a statement form. Because he's, he's saying, in, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And it could be that he's saying, are you really trying to reach me? Or he's saying, I've almost been persuaded to become a Christian. Either way, what Paul has been striving to do was recognized by Agrippa. It's recognized by him. And so, again, this is why Paul is such a, an incredible instrument for Christ because he was bold enough to speak before the king and before the governor and to be able to speak freely you know, regardless of his, uh, of his own health. In fact, he was even beaten in order for, to even have this opportunity uh, when, he, when he mentioned that he was a Roman citizen. That's why he was able to appeal to Caesar uh, in the first place. Uh, but, you know, I find it interesting, verse 32 says, And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But could it be possible that Paul was appealing to Caesar in order to have one more opportunity to give a defense. One more opportunity for, for someone to obey the gospel of Christ. I, I'm not sure, because uh, I, I, I doubt that Paul sat there and uh, regretted appealing to Caesar. Because at this point, what an opportunity he had, and what an opportunity he used. So you see how this is going to bless us as we go through and look at what Paul did and apply it to our own life and the opportunities that we will have. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 18, Paul relays this very, this very um, occasion. All right, Kim, if you can read that. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He's referring, thank you, to his first defense where he was deserted by those in his, in, in his entourage. Um, he could be referring to Luke. He could be referring to those who were with him. But he says, may it not be, be charged against them. But I love where he gained the ability to, the stamina, the, 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 the boldness to stand before the king and proclaim what he did. He said, the Lord stood by me. He says, I wasn't alone. The Father was with me, or he, the Lord was with me, and strengthened me. Uh, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed to, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I love it. He says, I was rescued from the lion's mouth. He was rescued. So he realized that, you know, standing charge, you know, uh, standing in that, in that way and uh, at, his own, at his first defense, that he was in the lion's den. But it was the Lord that rescued him from the lion's mouth. Uh, Jeffrey. Yes, I just want to mention that um, 
we kind of see before uh, Paul makes the appeal to Caesar, he, I think he understands he's destined not just based on what Jesus said in Acts 9, uh, but later on, we, he understands he's destined to go to Rome. And I think Paul intentionally determined, uh, determined that based on what Jesus says in Acts 23, 11. Uh, it says uh, in that verse, but on the night immediately following, the Lord stood by my side and said, take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed uh, to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness um, also, oh, um, witness at Rome also. So, Powerful. so he knew, you know, that he had to go to Rome, and I think that's why he made the appeal to Caesar. So um, that's a great but, point. Yeah. And you know, if you think about why he said the Lord was beside me, because the Lord literally told him, "You're going to Rome." He says, "You're you're going to Rome." Um, I think there was another occasion where he's saying that that many of it, many in this town are mine. I think it was in Lystra, but he, you know, Jesus is saying, "You're not going." You're not going to die. I mean, that gives that strength for, for him to be able to stand and have that boldness, knowing that Jesus was, was beside him. Thank you, Jeffrey, for, for that. And so the, the third was to carry the name before the children of Israel. Uh, Acts 17, 1 through 6. And I, I realize we've got about four minutes left, but all right, brother. And when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyon, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them for that three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the city, uh, these who have turned the world upside down have come here to you. Thank you very much, Steve. You know, uh, this, this leads us into the, the, the last, that they, to carry the name of Jesus, he would suffer. Uh, and as a result, this... This message, and I think it's very important to see, yes, he was commissioned to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Sometimes we say, Paul to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews. But he was also to go to the children of Israel. And so I think that's very important. He didn't forget where he came from. It was his custom. When he came into a town, that a synagogue was there, he went there first. And very possible he was reaching out to the uh, proselytes who were sitting on the back row, but also to his brothers. And so that's how he started. And so, again, there's a method there we will be looking at. And so that's really the last, we, well, we, it's right at 6 o'clock. Uh, and so we'll, we'll pick back up here next time. And so let's, let's go to God in prayer, and, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we, we're thankful for the missionary methods of Paul as we can look at his life and we realize that, that as Paul has said, we are to imitate him as he imitates Christ, that Christ himself said he was a chosen instrument, that when we take on that instrument, we will be equipped for every good work to strive to reach, to seek and save the lost in this community and beyond. And I pray that you'll help us this week, help us to be ready to be able to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within us like the Apostle Paul did. I pray that you'll be with us in this class as we're striving to, to study his methods and uh, to glean those so that we can apply them to our own lives to bring many sons and daughters to your glory. And we pray that you'll provide the increase through what we plant and what we water. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.